Good afternoon. We are group number three, and today we are going to talk about some of the famous characters of the High Renaissance, or also called the Elizabethan Age. Let's start talking about famous characters on science. First of all, we have William Harvey. William Harvey was born on 1578, and he died on 1657. Uh, William Harvey was an um, English physician who was the first to recognize the full circulation of the blood in the human body and to provide experiments and arguments to support this idea. Also, we have Andreas Vasalius. Andreas Vasalius was born on 1514 and he died on 1564. Andreas Vasalius was, um, sorry, is considered to be the founder of the science of anatomy, which is based on observa observation and experience gained by using a scapel on dead bodies of humans. It is how he provoked the valid statements Wrong. Now I am going to talk about uh, in literature, literature, we have one of the most important writers of the high renaissance that is uh, Christopher Marlowe. When we talk about Christopher Marlowe, we have to know that his life is a mystery and there, there exists so many uh, so many information about his life, but historians don't know if that information is true or not. Christopher Marlon was born in 1564, and he died in, in, in 1593. Uh, Christopher Marlon, when he was 14 years old, he studied at the kind school because he obtained a scholarship. Uh, later, two years later, he started in the College Corpus Christi, Cambridge, because he obtained uh, a, scholarship, a scholarship as well, and uh, he was graduated. He obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree. Uh, when we talk about Christopher Marlon, we have to say that uh, uh, in the Elizabethan age, he was so famous and he was considered one of the most important writers. Uh, also, he was known because he was the first uh, writer that used a blank verse. Uh, his verse was called uh, was called Marlon's Mightly Verbs. And also, we have to know that uh, Christopher Marlowe wrote seven plays. Uh, between that place, we have Dido, Queen of Carthage. Uh, the first part of Timberlane, uh, the Great. The second part of Timber Timberlane, the Great. The U of Malta, uh, Dr. Faustus. Also, we have Edward II. Here, uh, this uh, play was uh, so famous, but at the same time, so many people thought that Marlon was homosexual because the main characters of these plays were uh, homosexual. So also we have the massacre at Paris, uh, we have to say that Christopher Marlowe died uh, when he was 29 years old. So he died when he was so young and he just uh, he just wrote seven plays, but also uh, he translate, he, he could uh, he could speak Latin, he, he knew Latin. So that's why uh, he translated Ovid uh, and he was known for that as well. When we talk about Christopher Marlon, we have to say that, uh, so according to some historian, he they think that Christopher Marlon was a spy that worked for the Queen, but uh, we don't know if that is true or not. According to some historian as well, uh, in at the time in the High Renaissance, people thought that Christopher Marlon didn't work for the Queen. Uh, they thought that. Christopher Marlon worked for the Catholic uh, Church. And as we know, at that time, the Queen and the Catholic Church was almost, uh, was almost like enem enemies. So that's why uh, Christopher Marlon uh, start to have, started to have problems with, uh, with the people at that moment. And one night, uh, he died from a slab uh, warm uh, to to the eye, 
but uh, in a drunk can uh, fight. But this is arguable because some people who studied the life of Christopher Marlowe thinks that maybe he didn't die at the moment and that he faked his life, uh, that people think that he escaped to another country and uh, they think that maybe to Italy or, or France, but we don't know if that is true or no. And also a uh, historian thinks that he continued writing plays. And here is where uh, born a great mystery because people who study the life of Shakespeare and people who study the life of Christopher Marlowe thinks that maybe Christopher, uh, Christopher Marlowe wrote um, song of the places, uh, so song of the place that that we know uh, currently that were written by Shakespeare, but something that is secure that is uh, that we know is that according to the Oxford University Press, they said that the trilogy of uh, Henry V were was were written by Shakespeare, by, by Shakespeare, but also uh, they they impressed that, that the, the co-author uh, is Christopher Marlowe because in the high Renaissance was normal that songwriters um, uh, work together with another writer and uh, maybe they write, they wrote plays together because at that time it was very important to write uh, the plays so quickly because they need that to the queen. And also when we thought we have to know that um, Christopher Marlowe was very famous and uh, he was famous before Shakespeare. Uh, later, uh, Christopher Marlowe uh, died. Uh, Shakespeare, one year later, Shakespeare started to, to write plays. So that's why some people think that maybe uh, Christopher Marlowe was, uh, was behind the place of Shakespeare, but uh, Currently, we don't know if that is true or not. And this is a great, the great mystery that exists between this great uh, writer. Now, talking about art, um, this special topic about art is very interesting. And now the famous character that we are going to talk about is Nicholas Hillier. And Nicholas Hillier is a very important artist because he was, we can say, the first English born, uh, first native English born painter of the Renaissance. Nicholas Hillier was born in 1547. And Nicholas Hillier is described like the master of art during the Renaissance. And we, we are, we're going to see why this man was so important. Nicholas Hilliard was the person in charge to make the portraits of Queen Elizabeth during the Renaissance. And not only about Queen Elizabeth, he was the person in charge to make the portraits of Queen Elizabeth and all the court of the queen, something really important because the Queen Elizabeth was very careful with uh, her public image. He was very careful and not all the people or not uh, any person could um, paint the Queen. And Hilliard um, was very, very recognized because of his work, because he was, um, he had a lot of talent in the representation of people, the characteristics of the world, physical representation of people, but also he was a, ma um, a master in the representation of clothing. Nicholas Hilliard was very specialist and detailed person when he was working in the details of the clothes, in the details of uh, the faces, the, the world in general. So we can say Nicholas Hilliard revolutioned, uh, make a revolution in art because he created new methods to, to paint. Uh, he invented many methods of painting, like uh, make the details of the subjects of, in, in the faces, in the clothing, in the Elizabethan clothes. clothes. And um, this is something like a fun fact. Um, 
Nicholas Hilliard was so perfectionist that in some pictures, he used um, gold and real gold and real silver to create the details in the clothes of the queen. Also, Nicholas Hilliard used like um, animal tooth to create details in um, metals and things like that. So we can say Nicholas Hilliard was a master in this matter, in this topic, and that's why he's very important. He made his first portrait of Queen Elizabeth in 1572. And we can say Nicholas Hilliard made uh, most of the portraits that we know of Queen Elizabeth or uh, other person that were part of her court were painted for by, sorry, Nicholas Hilliard. Okay, as you have been listening throughout the presentation, in the High Renaissance, there were many uh, important characters in different areas. So now let me talk to you about one of the famous characters regarding to music. His name is William Bird. William Bird was born in London, England in 1539, and he died on July 4th, 1623. Um, William Byrd was a composer, organist, and virginalist. And the term virginalist, it refers to English keyboard composer. When I'm saying keyboard, I'm talking about teclado in Spanish. Okay, something really interesting about him is that there is not information about uh, his childhood or how was his relationship with his father or something like that. However, I found a um, curious fact about him. And it says that he was a student of one of the um, well-known musician of the early Renaissance, who was uh, Thomas Tallis. So we can conclude that if he had an amazing teacher, he will be, of course, an amazing uh, musician or composer as well. Okay, um, some years later, William Byrd and Thomas Tallis shared the responsibility of organists of the English Chapel Royal. The Chapel Royal is the church located in England that served the um, spiritual needs of the sovereign and the British royal family. And that event had um, a positive um, results in their life because some years later, the Queen Elizabeth gave them a paper or a monopoly um, for the um, importation, priding, publication, and sale of music. And she also gave them uh, the priding of music paper. So um, can you imagine how important it must be those composer in order to receive a gift or an opportunity from the Queen? And of course, they wrote an, a work or some songs. Actually, it were 34 motets. And of course, they dedicated uh, from the queen, to the queen, sorry. Um, years later, his teacher, that's been um, Thomas Salis, died. So William Byrd continued writing songs by himself. And it is estimated that almost 600 of his pieces have survived. And those pieces include um, church music with English text, church music with Latin text, metricals, um, keyboard music, instrumental music, and etc. As you can see here, I wrote some of the best work by Bird, but in my opinion, uh, Fantasia in name minor, it was one of the best one because um, it is this kind of song that is start innocently, but then uh, the rhythm changes and attract the attention of the people. And um, it is considered that Fantasia in name minor, it is um, Elizabethan roller coaster. So now my partner will continue talking about the other important characters. Um, well, now regarding philosophy, I want to talk about uh, Sir Francis Bacon. And uh, well, Sir Francis Bacon, born in 1561, he was an English philosopher and statesman who worked as a general attorney and also as a chancellor for England. 
Um, therefore, due to his great uh, contributions in multiple areas, he, he received a royal title, and that's why I am calling him Sir Francis Bacon. And well, his biggest contributions are the ones that he made for the scientific method, because he is actually considered to be the father of the modern scientific method. At his time, he believed that um, the scientific method they used wasn't enough because it was a scientific method based only on the observations on one experiment. Therefore, he created this uh, revolutionary method called the experimental scientific method, also known as the Baconian method at that time, in which he based his observations and his solutions on, uh, well, observing multiple and multiple experiments. Um, he died at the age of uh, 65 in the year 1626. And the hypothesis behind his death is that he died because he was, um, he was uh, doing this experiment in which he was trying to understand um, the consequences of cold weather in uh, meat. Therefore, he got sick in one of his journeys and finally he developed pneumonia and died um, at the age of 65. Unfortunately, he had no children, therefore, <clears throat> the royal, his royal title also died with him. Well, now regarding mathematics, I want to talk about uh, Francois Viet. Francois Viet was, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, he was a French um, mathematician and also a lawyer. Um, and this is the most interesting part because, uh, well, he received his bachelor on laws and he developed most of his professional life as a lawyer. He uh, finally became the counselor of both Henry III and Henry IV, uh, King of France. However, his biggest uh, contributions are the ones that he made uh, regarding math because he worked as a code cipher. And well, he actually avoided a war between Spain and French, France, I'm sorry, because he was able to decipher a letter uh, that King, the King Philip II, King of uh, Spain sent in which he was talking about attacking uh, France. And well, since he was able to decipher this letter, then the French army uh, was able to uh, prepare themselves in order to defend their country. And well, due to this uh, characteristic or this, uh, let's say, work he had as a code ciphering man, he uh, applied and he's actually the, the first one to actually apply the use of letters in mathematic equations. Therefore, he's considered to be the father of algebra. And uh, well, due to this new systematic mathematic uh, method, he believed that there was uh, a solution to every problem in algebra. So um, he died at the age of uh, 63, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken in the year 1603. Well, um, that was it for our presentation. Hope you have enjoyed and you have learned a little bit. And if there's no questions, then I guess we may conclude with this session.